Hello and welcome to the I Create Daily Podcast. I'm Leora Alderson. And I'm Devani Alderson. We are the mother-daughter co-founders of the I Create Daily brand. We are passionate about encouraging positivity, creativity, and productivity while bringing you information and resources that support your creative aspirations. I Create Daily is for creators in every genre of creating, from musicians to writers, crafters to inventors, bloggers to entrepreneurs. So if you are into creating anything, this podcast has something for you. So tell us, what would support you most in your journey? You can reach us at creators at iCreateDaily.com. Thank Thank you you for for joining joining us us on this this journey. Hello and welcome to the I Create Daily Podcast, conversations for kindling creativity for anyone in pursuit of the creative life. I'm Leora. And I'm Devani. And today's guest received formal training from the late poet laureate of Ottawa, Canada, Patrick White. Visual artist Patrick Ennis has been painting for 14 years, accruing an estimated 3,000 paintings across a wide variety of work. Patrick's work has shipped globally and exhibited at dozens of shows across Canada, including a a TV show titled Painting with Pat and numerous popular music festivals. Internationally known and published in a variety of magazines, Patrick Ennis often works in partnerships with other groups, including Acid Math, an apparel clothing line. In addition, Patrick accepts commissions ranging from landscapes, portraits, surrealism, and impressionism. Patrick is also a well-known artist on the electronic music scene, as well as having underground roots in punk rock, doing portraits for world-famous bands. We're eager to learn more from today's guest, so welcome, Patrick Ennis. Afternoon. Greetings from Canada. Yeah, greetings from Canada. So you were saying that it's like cold about seven months of the year where you are. So tell us again where in Canada you are. Um, right, I've been in Edmonton, Alberta, probably about 11 years now. And I think uh, last year we, we broke uh, the six-month barrier with temperatures below zero. Oh, which wow. is pretty- <laughs> That is hard. Uh, we don't envy you that. We don't envy you that. Well, right now, we are, yeah, as we're recording this, it is September. We are in North Carolina where it's hot. And uh, <laughs> so what's the temperature like there with you, where you are now? Is it is it cold yet? It's, it's still pretty nice here. It's uh, like lately, it's been about uh, between 15 and 20 degrees, which would be about 40, 45 degrees. In, wow. In okay. Night. So snowbirds for sure. Well, one of the things we were talking about is that the good thing about cold weather is it gives artists and writers and creators a lot of time indoors to create. Uh, So speaking of that, you have done so much uh, over so many years with your art. We love how you have it displayed behind you. So if our audience is listening uh, on the phone, you'll also want to go to, of course, Patrick's site and see his incredible art or see it in our podcast on YouTube, the video podcast on YouTube. Or, or our podcast website. But tell us, Patrick, how did you get started uh, being a professional artist? Well, uh, like the opener said, I had some uh, formal training from another artist who's actually more of a poet, but he also painted. And uh, in the little town I was in at the time, uh, pretty pretty basic uh, small town life. And, and uh me and just a few other friends were sort of, I guess, the wild kids in town, you know. Uh, we're, we're like hippies and we're all freaky with our mohawks and sort of trying to break out of the mold, so to speak. So at the time, uh, he saw something in me, I guess I didn't, you know, and uh, and sort of showed me the ropes a bit. Uh, at the time, I, I was going through a bit of a rough patch as far as, you know, teenage uh, whatever rock scene stuff, but I eventually you know, got my act together and, and cleaned up. And I always found that uh, even though uh, you can find some inspiration in, in, in certain things, they can also be unhealthy in the long run. <clears throat> and so, you know, once you're, once you've had your mind open once it's open, you know, and uh, anything after that is really just, uh, just overdoing it, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah. But uh, he was a very heavy heavy poet and um, there's the saying a picture is worth a thousand words is definitely true. Um, he, yeah, he was a good friend and a mentor, sort of gave me a few lessons and showed me the basics, uh, more of a landscape painter, but 
his theory was if you can paint a landscape, everything exists in a landscape. So it was mm -hmm. a good place to start. Yeah. And I sort of found my own my own sort of niche uh, in the last the first probably five five to ten years was just wrapping your head around how to do the stuff because it's you know everyone thinks art is easy till you pick up a paintbrush and then it's a different ball game. Right. So you know you just gotta put it's like learning to play guitar once you know all the chords you can play your own music so yeah so and uh yeah sorry i was just gonna ask did you so now um, you were a teenager yeah. when you got yeah. introduced to art and that's when you started did you also then start taking art classes either at high school or at community college i mean i mean Honestly, high school was a was a patterns and colors for me. <laughs> so, like, uh, I was very much uh, I don't know, I, I suppose I, I have authority figure problems, and I'm a very uh, independent person, probably to a fault. Um, but I, I always enjoyed the self creativity of painting. It's never the same day twice, and and you learn something every every time that you paint, right? So it's it's sort of a, a, a spiritual adventure as much as a, a technical adventure as well. Yeah, so, uh, so you didn't really have any formal um, art training then besides your mentorship with um, I mean, just, Patrick, just with, yeah. with him, but it, honestly, I, I got some friends that went to university and got a BA and they didn't teach them how to paint, <laughs> you know? It's like, it's, you're you're really better to find um, a, a good painter or a master yeah. to learn from because they, they have the hands-on experience that a piece of paper at university is not going to give you. Only, you know, they say 10,000 hours to master anything, and I, I really believe that. Yeah, no. And I also believe that anyone can do anything if they try hard enough. Yeah, we agree 100%, yeah. and we're big proponents of that, of learning yeah what it is you want to do um, from those who are doing it. Um, and oftentimes that isn't at university. So yeah, a hundred percent. That's fantastic. So, okay. So tell us a little bit about your journey. So you started painting in school. Um, you know, you were gifting it probably to family and friends. And then how did you begin? When do you remember the first painting you sold? The, well, the first painting I sold was the art lesson that, that I got at the time it was uh, a moon scene he, he liked to paint uh, a similarity between us is we both like to paint nighttime scenes which not too many people do everybody does sunsets and that sort of thing but uh, I was always sort of drawn to it I found it uh, mysterious I guess you could say yeah yeah mysterious and also <laughs> You do a lot of cosmological, like space paintings as well, mm -hmm. but and we'll get into more of that. But let's get back to you. so the first yeah. one you sold was a moon a moon painting. Is that what you said? Was my was my art, was my first art lesson that I received from him was the first painting I sold. So oh, it wow. didn't take me long to sell the first one. Fantastic. So where yeah. what was the venue? And like, I I sort of got well. Uh, uh, the first sort of real uh, like art show I had was I was actually selling art on the streets in the city of Kingston in Ontario. And anyway, there was a high school um, art show that was happening down the street. So I went and uh, and just sort of sat out front of this art show with my art. <laughs> and the lady that was running it uh, was a woman called Karen Peppercorn, and she let me into the show. Aww. And then I did probably about five years worth worth of shows just with this uh, with this really cool woman that let me into her art show for for this high school program, right? And then uh, then I sort of I went through a bit of a migration period where I traveled a bit and sort of explored the, my world, you know, and uh, that was for a couple years. And I also got involved with a, a charity at the time and eventually be, helped become one of the directors where we sort of um, did outreach work for like street kids and stuff because I sort of, I came out of that and then I wanted to, to help other people out of it, right? So it, it's sort of, there was a, a lot sort of all happening at the same time and I sort of found myself through art 
and as a great way to express myself without with benefit opposed to harm uh, yeah yeah and, and yeah and ever since I, I've been doing shows just all over Canada um, that I ended up in Saskatchewan where I had that TV show for a while about 10 years ago now and that was sort of fun just like your uh, like Wayne's world on access television yeah you know yeah definitely. yeah and then I ended, I ended up and I ended, went to BC for a little bit lots of artists in BC so you really gotta you really gotta test your grit out there because everybody's an artist you know <clears throat> and yeah. I ended up here uh, has some children yeah. here in Edmonton I've been here for some time now uh, honestly yeah, Alberta has been pretty good to me um, in British Columbia here in Canada there's a lot more of like a artist scene and a hippie scene but here in Alberta, it would be like the Montana of America. <laughs> so so on, the, on the one hand, you don't have quite so many open-minded people, but on the other hand, you can sort of be a bigger fish in a small pond because you're, there's not that many people that, that are doing it here full-time. So there is an opportunity at the same time. Yeah. Edmonton's I mean, been pretty good to me. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. I've had uh, art shows... Um, there's like really it's like you start off and you get like the odd show and it takes you a long time to paint and get ready for a show but it's like the more you do it the faster you get and the faster things start to happen for you mm -hmm. and yeah. so I do a lot of uh, ended up um, mostly I mean I enjoy the music but mostly because the the crowd on the EDM electronic scene sort of appreciates my um, I guess you could call it psychedelic, although I'm not, you know, it's, it's just is what it is. But so I ended up on the EDM scene and I've been doing a, a lot of different uh, music stuff with, um, there's a small group here called Tribal Nations who do like local small events at clubs in the city. And then it's sort of, you make connections and you meet people and I ended up started doing uh, some bigger music festivals here in uh, Alberta, one most notably uh, Astral Harvest, it's called. Mm -hmm. And then, and then once I get into that festival, anyway. So now I do like uh, go on a bit of a road trip here in the summer, and do about four to six festivals a year. And um, yeah, I've I've had art hanging here in um, the Art Gallery of Alberta, which is like our province of Alberta. So it's pretty good. Uh, you can't get any bigger than the art gallery of, of Alberta here in Alberta. Yeah. <laughs> so I've had some shows there with uh, some good folks called five artists, one love. And they're, they're, they're all uh, five uh, colored uh, artists, but they're also really cool people. So they let me in, even though I'm fairly pale, <laughs> yeah, so to speak. And, and uh, you know, but they're also trying to break the, the mold of you know being open and inviting different people canada is really a, a great melting pot in that sense that there you can be from anywhere and come here and be accepted mm -hmm. um yeah um yeah uh, on, as far as like and then there's always nowadays there's the internet side of the world you know this is this is out in the real world what i'm doing and then on the internet side i've been working with a great company uh, called Acid Math, who is, is basically an artist collective, and they do like clothing and prints and that sort of thing. I've been working with them for a number of years. Um, I, oddly enough, like thanks to the internet, I seem to have a decent fan base in South America, so I may have to wow. retire there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Interesting. So that, there's also... Sorry. Okay, go are ahead. You does that mean you're selling? Are we have a, for our audience, we have a little bit of a delay between, I mean, it's fantastic that we're able to connect with Patrick uh, in Canada, but there is a little bit of a delay. So um, are you selling art to South America or you just have a lot of followers from there? Uh, well, just a lot of, I seem to get a lot of great publicity from the groups, uh, artist groups down there. Uh, I don't, like here, there's, there are artists who are similar to me here. Whereas it, in a country far away, you're sort of an exotic creature. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah so yeah. The, 
it's hard to explain, but uh, I think there's a saying that uh, no man can be a prophet in his own country. Yes, definitely. <laughs> you know, but it's amazing how many people you can reach uh, nowadays, which is great because for me, like art is for to be seen by people, you know. And oh, yeah, man. you got one painting and you sell that painting, but really how many people see that piece is you know, the people I never meet that look at my art and feel a connection to it, you know, they're, I'll never know, but it's still, it's still neat that you can have this connection through, through it. Definitely. <clears throat> Definitely. Uh, most recently, there's a, a fairly bar, a big site called Other Perspectives on uh, Facebook. Anyway, there's about 10 million people on there and they've, uh, that it you just reach out you know like so i messaged this group a few years back like hey i think you might like my art you know show them the stuff and if they're nice people they'll they'll share it for you you know and it's beneficial for everyone because they're an art page you got mm -hmm. that art you know? yeah <laughs> so it works out yeah. last yeah. week i got close to four hundred thousand reached on facebook mm -hmm. which is a pretty good week for you know yeah <clears throat> well, yeah now that you mentioned that online element, what what are your habits around? So you mentioned in the summer you do about four festivals where you're showing your art at these music or art festivals. What does what does your time look like? How mm -hmm. much time do you spend painting and making your art? Because you definitely make a lot of art. And then how do you spend your time right. promoting it once you've made it? And how how what are your habits around the creation and the promotion of your work? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, usually, usually not always, I'll, I'll get up in the morning and, and sort of paint. A, a good day for me, especially living on art, is get up, paint a painting, have it done by the afternoon, go online and post it, sell it by the evening, and it's in the mail that night. Like, that's oh, the wow. success. That's the success. That's the objective for me every day. That's for amazing. And you and did it, one. It, you just sold one yesterday, right? Like we talked, the one of the ones above your head that was one of our favorites with the, the van, the love van at the ocean or, yeah, you just, you painted that, you posted it yesterday and you sold it last night, right? Yeah, that one's a little, like usually I just do about an arm's length, uh, mostly for easy carrying if you're getting out of the house to, to show this stuff. But I also paint on masonite, which is fairly thin, but also very hard. Um, it takes uh, more abuse, I find, than canvases do, especially if you're on the road with a bunch of art. This stuff's so solid, I usually put it under my tent at the festival, and it becomes my floor. <laughs> oh my gosh, <laughs> you know, so wow. it's, it's built, built tough, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Um, what was I saying again? You, what, so what we were talking question? about you. Yeah, you painted and sold that one yesterday. Right. And then uh, if it's a good enough one or I like it, I'll upload it to a website where it's available on clothing to prints to like shower curtains and every other product you can think of. But uh, for the most part, uh, I find that this, the actual paintings are what is the root of, of keeping my house up. You know, the prints and stuff are nice, but it's, it's more like extra money, right? And, and I, I sell uh, my art personally at, what I consider like a good price. But it also, if you're trying to live on it, you can't wait a year and a half to sell a painting. Like, well, this is worth like $5,000 and I've had it for 10 years. You know? <laughs> In the meantime, I'm selling like thousands of paintings at a reasonable cost. And people come back because they get, you know, good bang for their bucks, so to speak. Do you, do you know what I mean? Uh, I'm not one of those. I, I, I just want to do art like I'm not rich I'm probably not gonna get rich on it but like I'm doing it <laughs> you know Absolutely. yeah you're yeah. doing it so okay so give us do you have like how do you price your art and give us a guideline of how you it really it? depends like like if I if I go that's another reason I try and paint fast I use acrylic so that it dries fast but you also have to work fast um, and I try and keep it, you know, basically what I would charge for it, like a day's wage if, or, or two days wage so that it keeps the cost down so that people can afford it. Because not everybody can afford like to drop, you know, a bunch of cash on, on art when they got bills due. But, um, 
I don't know. It really depends on what the piece is, too. For instance, portraits take the most amount of time, whereas a landscape, I, I don't have to think. I just paint a tree, I paint a cloud, whereas uh, it really depends on, on what you want, how large it is. Um, but what my about... average price, sorry, sorry, sorry go, go, ahead. Ahead. go ahead. I mean, like if I'm doing a landscape painting uh, in North America, it's usually about 200 bucks or an 18 X 24 inches. And then it, it goes up from there. But I like to keep it in that range where, for instance, if you're in America, you actually get it cheaper because of the exchange rate. So uh, I'd say about 30% go to the U.S. in the last few years. So they, you know, it's, it's like a win-win. I get a little bit more because people are from America and people in America are like, wow, that's a great price, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And what about for commissions? How Do you have any advice how, on how you'd choose to charge for commission work? Well, it really depends on what it is. Like a lot of times people will try and say things like, oh, I only want like a 10 by, by 14 painting as if that were somehow easier to paint a person that's smaller, when in reality it's actually much harder to paint that tiny. And you'll notice that anytime you see a really good portrait, it's always like a seven foot canvas and their eyeballs are like two feet wide. But it's like that's... I, I can appreciate that, but the bigger you do it, the easier it gets. And so it's like, if you're doing like a portrait that's about life size, it usually takes the most amount of time. And uh, uh, it really depends where you live too. Shipping can fluctuate. You know, like I sent one to uh, the Netherlands last week. And so you got to factor this stuff in when you're, when you're trying to, accommodate people in some countries the, the exchange rates ridiculous where a few hundred dollars here would be like thousands in their money so it's I kind of mm -hmm. don't like that the, those people don't have access just because of you know the way it's set up but, right plus, but I, I plus do plus try and keep them fair sorry. sorry I didn't mean to step on your words I sorry. do I do try it's okay there's like a three second lag here it's like a time machine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you were saying I do try it really to. Is. Uh, just keep the my costs at a, at a reasonable, what I would pay for it, essentially. Yeah. But a lot of artists, uh, it's funny because I'm an artist, but I, a lot of artists are, are super pretentious uh, in a lot of respects, uh, especially when it comes to, to selling their stuff. But if it does take somebody three months to paint something, I can understand that they have to charge a lot more than somebody that can do it faster, can can basically sell it cheaper. So I've tried to find this middle ground where I do good quality work, but also keep it within a range that it's feasible to work with. Yeah, so I'd rather not. sell a bunch of work for a moderate price than not sell any at a high price. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, there's a lot to be said for learning how to be more efficient and productive mm -hmm. because I think probably most everything that we, any of us do, um, we can speed it up. You know, like even whether it's walking, yeah. you know, walking out the door yeah. or... Uh, the, the painting you're uh, referring to, the van, um, we could probably share that image afterwards, but yeah. the the first day that I started it, I actually underpainted with like a, a thick gesso paint, and I basically it's almost like stucco, uh, where I'm creating the texture just with white paint, and I let it get dry, and then afterwards when I wash it, the color falls in the cracks, so to speak. And so over the years, I've definitely developed techniques in order to maximize the effect and minimize the time and that just comes from experimenting with what works and what doesn't yeah so it, even though it looks like a the paint is really textured it's actually the underpainting doing most of, at least half of the work and mm -hmm. and in that way I, I cut the time in half where i don't have to spend a lot of time building layers of paint because it's already underpainted Ah, very clever. Yeah. 
Yeah. Well, well, did you, did you learn some of your efficiency from the poet painter that you were, that mentored you, or is that just part of your inner desire to just get it done? Discoveries along the way. Yeah. Yeah. No, definitely. Uh, he took his time a bit more and, uh, I just, I'm interested in, in shortcuts that are effective. Yeah. It, it just helps me in the long run. Absolutely. No, it makes yeah. a lot of sense. And there's, I mean, that's how you discover new technique. But yeah, absolutely. I've also like a lot of research as far yeah. as like if, if I'm at a, at an art gallery or center where there's physical paintings, I will go over and look at how they did that because the best way to learn is to just see what other people have done. And there are a lot of good YouTube tutorials, although most of them are in the beginner side of things. If you do dig, you can find like university grade, like high end realism and how to do it. You just got to really search. Yeah. Uh, but really hands on is definitely the best way. I think I learned the most personally, though, just from being in the room, watching my art mentor physically paint the thing in front of me. Be, just seeing how they do it was was literally the probably the most beneficial thing. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then the next best thing, doing it yourself, mm -hmm. and like you said, trial and error over time. Yeah, yeah definitely. So I mean, so they're like uh, think like a like a scientific experiment. You know, yeah. not every one of them is going to be cured for cancer. Some of them are going to be monstrosities, <laughs> but you know. You know and but it's funny because art is super subjective where i'll think oh man i nailed this painting it's beautiful i'll have it for like a year and then i'll do one i'll be like i hate this painting it sucks and it'll sell right away you know yeah. because it really is the person who's viewing it and it's up to them to decide that not you you're just creating it good or bad that's a great point. Yeah. yeah, that's a great point. So artists, get your work out there no matter what you think of it. The, I think the bottom line lesson from that is uh, fast. Uh, it's just to keep on progressing more quickly. Getting more work out there, the faster you can get more work out there, the more you will learn from it and find the iterations yeah. that work best. Ex expect the first 10 years to be just you learning and putting it out there and building a building a repertoire for the first 10 years is you're chasing customers. You're trying to find people. And then after some time, you just keep plugging away. People will start to come to you to look for it instead of you looking for them. Yes. Definitely. You just got to put in your time. Yeah, that makes so much sense. So on the painting we were talking about the, uh, with the van that's larger than some of yours, um, can you share how much that sold for? I mean, uh, it, that one was actually too big to mail it anywhere. So I sold it locally to a, like a friend of a friend. And I think I got about 300, 350 for it. That is also an unusual case. I used a canvas for that one. Yeah. Uh, which is in my, if it's local, I'll, t I'll probably do that. Unless the customer specifically wants that. But I do prefer, a, it's a super flat pressed wood panel. So I have to sand it and then prime it myself. So if you want a grid texture, you'll have to create it when you're when you're when you're gessoing it to, before you start painting with a white. But also, like I said, uh, I'll use that technique to create rocks where it's like stucco and it's broken and in very thick. Um, the one neat thing about uh, gesso paint that a lot of people don't know is. As soon as you add water to gesso, it actually has a fast drying agent, which lets the paint get a lot thicker quicker. Hmm. So uh, if you just add a little bit of water, wait a little bit, it'll turn almost into a tooth toothpaste consistency where it'll really catch on that surface. But I also prefer the super flat surface because I use a lot of water, especially in a space painting. And uh, I'll find that the canvas, uh, the paint gets stuck in that square patterns unless you uh, build it up super flat but yeah. I, I do prefer the flat surface because i can just throw a line down without having to fight a texture of a canvas 
Right. Now, what is the name again of the flat board that you talked about? That you're it's just um, masonite, masonite. Our, our particle board, um, similar to the stuff they use to layer the back of most dressers. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Do you but, get yours from an art supply store or from like a hardware store? I usually just go to a hardware store and, and you can get it up to a three quarters of an inch thick, which is very heavy, but honestly, it'll probably last a thousand years. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I prefer not quite that thick, but uh, it does get heavy after about 10 paintings. It feels like you're carrying like bricks, yeah. right? But well, it, it is very durable. And speaking of the weight, I mean, that's a consideration because while it is the exchange rate is better for U.S. buyers and customers, uh, there is the shipping, which is very expensive. Yeah. Uh, I find in North, uh, North America, it's not too, too bad. Usually, uh, it depends where you live. Actually, cities are cheaper to mail than if you live in a rural country area. They right. have to pay someone to go out there and deliver it. I usually always send it Signature Express delivery, and then I, I overpackage it because postal services are violent, <laughs> especially <laughs> the package is fragile on the side of it. <laughs> so, yeah. So I, the, I definitely go that to an art uh, where I can keep it minimized size, but also have it can take a beating. So do you, <laughs> that, sorry, go ahead, Patrick. I said I took some, uh, my packaging is an art form in itself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, speaking of that, do you buy pre um, uh, packaged, like do you buy boxes already put together or are you taping cardboard around your paint? I usually, uh, like I, yeah, I usually like um, first I'll make, uh, I'll build up some corners so that in the event of somebody throwing the painting against the wall, there's a buffer zone, which I usually have at least four different layers of cardboard or two double thick cardboards, yeah. but uh, th this stuff's a bit, yeah. the only way you can really break it is if you fall on it and the whole thing snaps in right. half. But uh, yeah, I usually have at least four layers of, of a thick cardboard, not like thin cardboard, like like package your television in it, those kind of, that kind of stuff. Yeah. And I found that it's, it's pretty good over the years. And then I duct tape the head corners heavily. You need like to, operate to get it out of the package <laughs> right <laughs> right and do you get most of your boxes are you buying the boxes pre-made uh from uh like online or from a local supplier no i like there's a i just usually just find a recycling center and find them there be, because like it's there's so much cardboard in the world we don't need to uh, cut down another tree to mail painting right. <laughs> it's like yeah. there's so much of it you just go find it uh, i have a convenience of being close to a place here that usually has a lot of fairly large boxes yeah and then i right. that, it. that helps a lot yeah. so tell us where do you um okay so we you mentioned the shows most of your online painting um how how are you marketing most of that? Where is it getting purchased from? Is it from your website? I mean, your Facebook page, and then you use PayPal. Um, Where do you get most of your sales from? If I mean, if it's out of uh, country, I usually take PayPal. But probably in the last three years, it has been going sort of globally. Now, first it starts in your little town that you're in, and then it sort of spirals out, you know, and then you start shipping to the next province over and then you start shipping the next country over it and so on and so forth but as far as the originals go um i sell i do a lot of events which is there's 99 ways to sell a painting and you got to use them all if you want to be an artist <laughs> so uh and then yeah so usually i'll post it on my social media like facebook seems to get the most uh, as far as online sales go and then I do have my website set up that if people want a print of an already sold piece or clothing or whatever else they want, they can go to my website. And, and then, yeah, uh, and the other part of it is just getting out of the house where people are and yeah. doing events with different organizations if you can. I, I do like donating the odd piece to charity uh, here in Edmonton, like Kids with Cancer is like, if I got a stack of 20, 30 paintings, like it's a good cause, you know, yeah. just donate it, you know, 
you know, yeah. get, you know, people remember this. You yeah, know? that's a great point. So yeah. you just got to put, give it away. You, you really are just giving yourself away for a long time, you know, and then it's, it comes back eventually, but don't do it expecting a gratification of like, everyone's going to worship me today or something. It doesn't work like that, you know, just do it for the love of it you know, and hope the rest works out. <laughs> yeah. Because you can, you know, drive yourself nuts trying to stress out over things when really you should just be creating and enjoying it. And if it, you are, it shows in the work, you know, yeah. and, and then people want it yeah. because like, you know, he's doing it for the love. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's fantastic advice because, and here's the thing, even if it takes five years, to sell your first painting, most likely it won't. If you're doing, if you, if the artist is doing what you're doing, and that is constantly putting yourself out there, giving things away, posting your paintings every day, producing a lot. Um, but even if it took five years, you're going to be painting anyway. So you know, be in the journey, enjoy the journey, and then you know, look yeah. for all opportunities to for exposure. And speaking of that, so um, you mentioned Acid Math as one of the companies that you've been partnering with for quite a while. So can you share what that's like, like how that works, what they do, what you're selling, uh, and how that works? Well, uh, Acid Math started a few years ago with a, a gentleman called Justin Doyle, also known as Bill. And uh, he sort of saw that there was a lot of people, like probably like you and myself, that are out there in the world. And he sort of started creating this Facebook group at, in the beginning just as a collective of like-minded people uh, that were, you know, most of them are hippies, I guess, if you had to classify it, although it's a very wide variety, given that we're going on to third generation hippies here, you know, nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> You know, like, I don't know about you guys. Like my mom was a daddy was a, a biker and mommy was a hippie. So <laughs> any questions? <laughs> you know, so there is this like uh, uh, I was fortunate enough to grow up in an era where people were where everything was a, a little more freer at least than it is today. People, you could let your kid go play outside and then whistle at dinner time when they come home. You know. So uh, I was, I, I'm happy that I grew up in a time before the internet. As an artist, I'm also super happy that the internet exists. <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely. And that we have the opportunities like this. So, so with Acid Math, they created a Facebook page. Now, is it, there's a, remember the, there's, I know there's another collaborative I'm not bringing to mind at the there's moment that where it is that designers can submit their design or artists can submit their designs and then they may be selected like for a hoodie. Remember the, uh, the hoodie company is one Epic hoodie, Epic hoodie is one of them, is. but then it's like they partner yeah. with a bunch of other collectives. It's yeah. like a bunch of collectives partnering with each other too or something. Yeah. Like so that. how is it? So when you say, is it just that you're um, publishing your work on acid math or how is that working? Well, like, the, uh, I mean, the, the gentleman's put a lot of work into acid math. Like they have acid math art. They have acid math like off the grid. They have like, so there's a whole bunch of different sort of subcategories as far as acid math goes. But basically it's living an alternative lifestyle. You know, I, I think there's about 200 artists, uh, visual artists on there now. There's music. There's There's a fairly wide variety of things that, you wouldn't find in a traditional society, you know, shopping at Walmart. <laughs> but the, human beings are spiritual creatures, whether we like it or not. Like, whether, and that doesn't mean in a religious sense. It just means like, holy crap, here we are <laughs> in the universe watching itself. So, it's, you know, there's uh, in society, there's sort of a, I don't, there's always this counterculture of like, you know spiritually conscious people and like uh, nowadays you know it's like i hate to say the word capitalism but that's the world that we live in you know or go to work pay buy a house you're not a human being unless you own a car you know and, and meanwhile the rainforests are burning or we're all going to work so it's like it's it is revolutionary but it's also open-mindedness at the same time yeah, and consciousness, basically. 
Con uh, conscious capitalism is a good thing. And that's what you're doing, basically. You're creating the work, you're creating your own opportunities. But speaking of that, so how, um, you mentioned that you might have a job, like some of the time, how long have you been supporting yourself with the art um, and have you needed work well, I, in between? I've been doing art uh, about 14 years and I'd say about the last five years, I was just doing art 24 hours a day, like seven days a week. Uh, I think my aver I average about 300 paintings a year. Some wow. days I'll do two, some days I'll do none. But uh, it took a lot of work to be able to paint 300 a year, you know. But yeah. it's like, I love it. It's never, like I said, it's never the same day twice. And also when you take a commission, for instance, I discovered a knack for painting cats and dogs that I, I would otherwise probably wouldn't have went quite into if somebody didn't say, hey, can you paint my dog? You know, like, and then you do one dog painting and I was like, oh, this is my life now. I paint dogs all the time. So, <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time it's a great way to to branch out and i really advise you know people want to uh, artists are stubborn everyone i want to do it my way i want to paint my thing you know and it, it's counterintuitive to an artist but they really should branch out try landscape painting try portraits because you learn something from all these different aspects uh, mm -hmm. i didn't actually call myself an artist until i could paint anything and then it's like, okay, now I'm an artist. Now, you know, now I can do it, you know. So a lot of people are aspiring artists, uh, so to speak. But until you've got on top of it and sort of mastered your craft, I think it should be more of a title that you earn, you know, by, by paying your dues, uh, yeah. so to speak. So um, everybody's an artist until an artist shows up. <laughs> <Good point. laughs> so okay so you i'm not clear are you supporting yourself full-time as an artist now or have you been for a while, off and on how or are you also still needing Actually, to supplement this, this, this. well it's uh like i've been getting by as an artist like i'm not like saving to retire you know but it's you got to build the frame of the house before you put the roof on it you know yeah. So it's, I've been putting it in and putting it in. I, I recently just started taking like a construction job just to get the rent paid here in Alberta. But to be honest, I've been making more off my art than I have been off the construction job. So yeah. it's, it's sort of a, I, I, I prefer to do art all the time, but it's also, it is unpredictable. And even if you paint one that's a masterpiece, you, the other half is you have to find someone to sell it to it if, if you're trying to live off art which right. which kind of sucks because i just want to do art for the sake of art but right. the other side of it is like okay you have a financial right. gun to your head every day to make it happen so there is a there is a lot of pressure as far as as far as surviving off your art it's not it's not for the faint of heart right i would say yeah. right well I mean, but it is possible if you're yeah. if you're hungry enough Absolutely. Well, I appreciate your honesty in that. And I think that that's something that most many artists who embark on it try, I mean, experience. And that is, it's like a roller coaster. Some days and some years are, are in some months are better than others. Um, and it's really, it is wise to, if you have an opportunity to get a paycheck, you know, to do oh, yeah. that and then do your art yeah. in your spare time. Uh, and at least that will allow you a cushion and not have the stress. Mm -hmm you know, that where it is that your art then becomes like work that you don't enjoy anymore because you have to do it um, just to support yourself. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. So it is a, it is sort of, it, there is a duality involved in that, in that, I don't know, but I've always tried to just focus on the art and just hope that the rest works out in the background later, you know, so, but usually I'll, I'll build up a collect, a body of work. For instance, before the festivals this year, I painted about 40 paintings in three or four months to get ready for the road trip on the, you know, and then so, so I'm building it up on the one hand and then I'm getting out in the world and sharing it on the other side of things. Yeah. So you, you really have to do both. You're, you're both an introvert and an extrovert, 
especially yeah. if you want to succeed doing it. That's Definitely. a good point. That's a good mm-hmm. point because a lot of artists and creators, including writers um, and painters, are, are because cre- much of creating, unless you're doing more performance-based art, is a very like focused zone in time where right. you it's you and your canvas or your page or whatever it is, and so you do have to balance the the making and then the marketing and being the extrovert or storyteller or whatever around your work. Yeah, so like I said earlier, I, I like I get up and I paint the body of work. Once the work's done, then I post it. I have a bit of a time on the social media where I'm sharing it. Also, um, I've been using uh, some animation effects. Where yeah, you we were going to ask painting. you. We were going to ask you about that. It looks so amazing on your. On your... Like, Go ahead, tell us about yeah, it. Yeah, so as long as there's like a, a good flow to the piece, you can actually co- sort of loop the the gif or animation back on itself so it appears that the waterfall is continuously falling or the waters are rippling in the painting and i i I do embrace the side of things where i think artists should use technology if they can um i personally uh give more credit to artists that use real paint that can paint a masterpiece opposed to someone that uses a photoshop program to apply layers <laughs> and call it an art piece. So I, I always have had a lot more respect for actual physical paint in reality that I've also found uh, you can create the illusion of open space in a, in a physical painting that a computer so far just can't achieve, hmm. uh, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I think you can I've, step I've, into it. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that since that's your foundational medium, it makes sense Mm -hmm. that that would be your first love and appreciation. And and I do think that each medium has its own nuances and its advantages and its its, uh, limitations. Um, That the artist today who can blend them all. And speaking of that, so you digitize your art because you are putting it online for selling prints and all that, which is fantastic because otherwise your original is gone forever. So it only makes sense to leverage, you know, and multiply through the mediums available. How do you do that? Are you using what kind of camera are you using to take the photos? I I actually, the phone that I'm using, I bought the, the, the new Hawaii Hawaii or Hawaii, whoever you want to pronounce it, but they have the best uh, digital camera on the phone, oh. which will let me, it'll let me do, um, like, as far as nice and clear shots, it'll let me create an 18 by 24 inch, which is the same size as the paintings, most paintings that I do. But if you want to do, say, a wall tapestry, it might be a good idea to find, like, an actual photographer with a, a DSL and and, and that sort of thing, because you, you can go so big, but um, it's important to have a, at least like a 21 megapixel camera if you wanna, if you wanna do some high quality prints. That makes sense. And what's the app that you use for the motion you mentioned earlier? There's, there's a couple. Uh, I mean, uh, sometimes I'll post a painting and other artists that are a bit more in, in depth uh, with with that format will animate my stuff for me and I've been working with uh, the real uh, the re- uh, the original OG on uh, Instagram he does some amazing um, on on that side of things all digital animations that are they're beautiful in, in their own right but they're, it's just different at colors of the same rainbow i um, also been working with some great groups here in Edmonton that do visual stage productions. So they'll, I'll send them my animations and they'll add their own sort of digitized computer psychedelic effects and project it on the backdrop while a band is playing too. And these things are really amazing. I, I wish I could had one to show you now, but uh, it's neat to see like how it started as an acrylic painting I digitized it onto and made it look like it's moving. And now I'm sharing it with this production company who's got it a hundred feet wide on a wall. <laughs> you know, it's like you're in the painting. You're oh, like wow. in the universe. You oh, know? Wow. That, that must be fantastic. I've also, as a creator and as the painter of the painting, that must be especially uh, gratifying yeah. to see and to experience walking into your own painting. Cause you've been spending so much time with it anyway. 
So that sounds wonderful. Yeah. The so, last time, the, um, are you familiar with the band Infected Mushroom? You no, not them? really. And they're, they're, they're a pretty heavy EDM band here. They're playing here in Edmonton. I was like, holy crap, this band, I really love this playing. And like my art's on the wall behind them while they're playing. Awesome. It's, That's amazing. It's and so cool. how, how did you get it? How did you get it so that they were using your art? I just um, like because I've toured the local scene here and I've met the these crews. I actually seen uh, some digital animations on a, on the screen. So I went up to the guy that was running the thing, like, "Hey, can I send you these things?" You know, like, and I, I just uploaded it to my Gmail and send it to him. And then he's like, "Wow, this is great because they don't have that sort of originality that." Uh, my my art does you know granted it's a cool psychedelic program that has its own effects but it really gives it a different a unique element that you can't really find anywhere else and it's that's really true. been neat to work with them that's a great so it's another example of a collaboration that you know you gave them for free to use that could lead to exposure and sales to your art yeah, I mean, most of the people that are at these shows probably won't know who did it, but they can still see it and be like, whoa, that's super cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, put your signature on. Maybe your signature can be clear. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's clear. It's clear. Yeah. Whatever. It's yeah. there. They could find it. So before we let you go, we, um, you, I did want to ask you, you've been doing a lot of cosmological type of paintings going into space. So is this mm -hmm. like a phase or is that just a, you know, a favorite I mean, genre? it's one of my yeah. favorite I, I just love people swimming in outer space where it, you can't, obviously it would never happen in reality, but you can really pull it off in a painting and, and have it look amazing. Like, um, hold on, I'll, I'll just grab one here real quick. Bring it closer. So let's see here. So if you can see here. Yeah. This, yeah. Right, so obviously this could never really happen, but here it is. You know, this woman is wading through time and space. Wow, you know? that's so. It's cool. an it's amazing that art can do this. You yeah. know, and I love the the way it, there's almost like um a stream of light from the from the universe to her crown to her head. That's a really yeah, cool visual as well. You, you can't really tell where the water starts and the sky stops. It just sort of you can blend these two realities somewhat seamlessly into one image that's just uh, it plays with your mind and not even just immediately just over time in general i'm really interested in giving longevity to the piece where mm -hmm. you can look at it some years later and it still gives you some kind of a feeling i guess yeah or yeah. make you think you know yeah that's fantastic well then you start to question like how is this real yeah yeah, definitely. Well, it helps people dream. Paintings like that help people dream and vision and imagine, which are it's really important for the human spirit. Or even just stop and consider, like, hmm, I wonder what if what if that was possible? Yeah, you know? like how would that feel? Yeah, right. Yeah. So, yeah. So you've given us a lot of. Well, that's the beauty of it. It is. Sorry. The painting. I'm sorry. No, go, I yeah. said it, that's the beauty. It is possible in painting. Yes, right. Mm -hmm. It is possible in painting. So you've given us a lot of great tips. You've shared your productivity habits of creating, you know, the first half of the day uh, and then later marketing it, which is fantastic. Um, and just that you have to be out there everywhere that you have a chance with your art. That's really great. Uh, we will include your links to your uh, site and Facebook in our article and our podcast uh, notes, show notes. Show notes. Yeah. Um, so we'd like to close with your sharing, inviting you to share if you have any vision of where you would love to see your art go in the future. Hmm. That's a big question. <laughs> I mean, uh, in you in the future uh, things are going to be uh, i don't even think we can speculate as to what the tomorrow holds given the amount of change even in the last 20 years to where the world is today so it it's hard to speculate what the future will bring but um uh, i i've always wanted to create an interactive um art room where basically you uh, can put on like a virtual reality helmet 
and step into one of these paintings and and wade through the cosmos and you know so i'm sort of i'm very interested in creating a whole world that is made of art opposed to just having a, a snapshot of it so uh, oh, yeah. the technology i think is going to bring us into some uh, pretty mind-blowing areas soon I'm hoping <laughs> yeah no that sounds fantastic and I mean AI is very mm. much on the forefront and that I'm so glad you mentioned that because that will just open up a whole world another world speaking literally and figuratively yeah, you really, you really go into the mind of a, of a human being with it you know and yeah. that's the beauty of it Yes, we're trapped in this physical reality, but like Einstein said, imagination is more important than knowledge because knowledge is limited. Whereas uh, I do like artificial intelligence in that on the um, technical side of things, I, I also wonder where the spirituality would be in that, <laughs> you know, unless we are the ones that provide it. Yeah, oh, I think I think we have to be, and it, it begins with us, you know, and how we're living and how we're thinking and believing, and uh, and what and, we share and what we create with the AI, as opposed to just letting it take its own life, letting it take on its own life. We have to be part of the process of of making it something better. One thing, well, one thing, um, especially when artists come together say like uh, say i'll meet different painters at a festival when they come together they forever affect each other uh just by the simple interaction of them coming together if i'm painting and there's another artist next to me painting i can see what they're doing and they can see what i'm doing there's sort of an exchange that happens yeah. and you know and from that day forth uh, you know now i can paint a landscape thanks to my art mentor and in this way, you sort of alter each other irrevocably, especially when it comes to, to artists coming together. And they, they inspire each other. Like uh, Jimi Hendrix said, he just wants to inspire people. And yeah, he sure did. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. So it, absolutely. It, it really... That's... Yeah, I'm sorry, there, what was the last thing you said, really? It's, it's just, uh, I just find it amazing that uh, it's almost... Uh, uh, it's almost like, um, what's that, uh, synchronistic happenings in a charged particle field, or yeah. uh, what's that, where quantum entanglement, where once two particles yeah. come together, they can forever each affect each other over vast distances, is similar yeah. to that. You know, even nowadays, artists are still taking cues from Van Gogh, you know, right. uh, over 100 years later, you see? Yeah. So it's... Uh, I, the 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 artist in the in the foreground really set the stage for the next generation of artists to come. You know, absolutely. Yeah. So. And we've done an article on how this is. We believe, and I think we're not the only ones to say this or write about it. That we are already in the new rena renaissance, or renaissance, depending on where you are pronouncing it. That uh, art right. is once again going to lead the way, and I love ending on that note. Your vision of how artists affect each other um, and inspire each other, as you have inspired us and our audience today, and as your art inspires, and we're going to be holding that vision for you as well of your art in the future. Like, and imagine a complete surround room, you know, yeah. of Patrick Ennis art. Right. That would be fantastic. I know. Oh, Hopefully we'll be able to float in your space sometime in the future. <laughs> great. Well, it was nice talking with you. Thank you. Nice talking with Hope you. Hope you guys have a great day. You, you too, too, Patrick. Bye. 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 Thanks so much for joining us for the I Create Daily podcast. Please let us know what creatives you would like us to interview and what topics you would be interested in hearing more about. And if you enjoyed this show, please leave a review on iTunes. We value your feedback. We read all the reviews and it just helps us get the word out on the I Create Daily podcast. Thank you so much. Thanks so much.